everybody and welcome to Shattering This, the program that is devoted to those of you who are open to the realization and to those of you who recognize that all of the world's religious, political, patriotic, military, economic, and media institutions, as well as most academic uh, institutions, are corrupt. They're counterproductive. They're working against your interests. For those of you who realize that politically correct means that you will be incorrect most all of the time. It repulses me, really, that the media is in a frenzy about the arrival of a man who would dare to call himself by a Roman title, Pope. It's not a Christian title. It was only a religious title in the sense that that those over the government of Rome, Imperial Rome, who referred to themselves as God, who were worshipped as if they were gods, who had their subjects sign declarations declaring them to be gods, took upon themselves. They became the father of their country. Pope is the Latin is from the Latin, meaning father. It was used by Julius Caesar, by Octavian, who became Caesar Augustus, from which we get the pagan months of July and August. It is a term that was used by Caligula, who claimed to be deified, had statues of himself erected in temples. It was a title claimed by Hadrian, perhaps the man singularly most despised by God in all of human history, at least second perhaps only to Paul, the founder of the Christian religion. A man who would do what Yosha said, do not do. Do not call anyone father. And yet he will claim to be the Holy Father. Imagine claiming to be the spokesperson of someone bearing a title that person said don't ever use. It just smacks of hypocrisy. But that's the nature of religion. There was a regal ceremony at the White House. Here's a nation that claims, whose constitution has a clause that the nation shall not interfere with the free expression of religion, unfortunately. And yet, they have the nation's governmental institutions doing what the Supreme Court has routinely says it cannot do. Endorse one religion over another by accepting to the White House the head of the largest religious institution on earth. Roman Catholicism. And not only the president receiving him in a gala reception, because he did not want to be outshined by Congress, because the Speaker of the House, Boehner, emerging from the northern suburbs of Cincinnati, where Roman Catholicism is rife, invited him to speak before Congress the first time the U.S. Congress has ever granted such an honor to a pope or a religious leader of any kind. It's repulsive. In breach of their own constitution, tripping over each other to endorse this man, calling him inspirational, allowing him to wear his religious garb, giving him credibility, it is interesting, too, that in his speech before Congress, America's elected officials are being told not to touch him. Do not shake his hand. Do not speak to him. Treat him as, oh, if he were God. And yet, upon his arrival in an Alitalia aircraft, what did the President of the United States do? Shook his hand. I guess it's okay if you're the same. Both communists, both Muslim supporters, both acting as Christians. 
Why not? Kindred spirits, shall we say. Scott, you wanted to add something? I, I was just going to say that, that what you just said, uh, birds of a feather. <laughs> yeah. Birds of a feather. So um, Pope, the president, called the Pope's words and his opening remarks inspiring. If he inspires you, you're a nincompoop. An absolute nincompoop. In fact, they gave the, uh, the Pope's uh, schedule. You know, instead of the state dinner that is, uh, is held for heads of state, and he's the head of the state because Roman Catholicism has always been a political entity. And he's head of the state known as the Vatican. That he is not going to attend the state dinner. No, he's going to lead a, um, a mass at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> Tonight, my friends, is Yom Kippur. Yahweh is very clear, and I'm going to read what he has to say about Yom Kippur in a minute. You know what he says about Yom Kippur? And I'm going to just give you an, an inside hint in case you're not familiar with it. He says, if you do not answer this invitation to join him on this day of reconciliation, then you will be forever estranged from him. That is what he has to say in this regard. Now, that being the case, we do not have to interpret. We don't have to make an assumption. We know for absolute certain that this Pope and all who will join him, all who follow his example, all who are inspired by him, will be separated from God. That means, my friends, since there isn't one Roman Catholic, maybe in the history of the religion, but certainly not alive today, who will answer Yahweh's invitation here on Yom Kippur. There isn't and has never been a single Roman Catholic in heaven. Not one. The saints that they pray to, at least those that they have properly characterized, as in the case of St. Paul, St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuit order to which Pope Francis belonged, are all in Sheol. Better known are more commonly known as hell. Every pope who has ever lived, when their soul gave way, that soul was transported to hell. They're all there. Every single one of them. And the, they're there for the consequence of leading people astray. Now, that's not to say that all of those they have led astray are in hell. Very few of them. The victims of such hypocrites are not in hell. Yahweh would never do that. They have been victimized. They have squandered their souls, for sure. But it is only the perpetrators, those who have led others astray, that find this consequence. Well, again, birds of a feather, right? I mean, yeah. so and, and it, it would be against his, it's against his nature to do that. He says that there's things that people that he doesn't care about that he doesn't know. Yeah, that's correct. But he does he, he he does know of these people, of these popes and stuff. Oh, and he course. does know what they do. Yeah, he's not he's not personally paying attention to them, other than uh, he he just broadly categorizes them as an abomination. We read that passage yesterday in this program. So he categorizes them as an abomination and says that he, he hates them to the degree that they fall into the perpetrators of religion. He despises them. So he does not have a relationship with them other than he is generally aware of what uh, all religious promoters do and is disgusted by them. That's, we read that yesterday. It's from Yermaya. I can share it again today. But God, in this case, is unequivocal. Now, what's also interesting is this Pope tonight, rather than celebrate Yom Kippur, which is not going to be mentioned, he won't even mention that today is, uh, uh, begins, uh, that this is an invitation from God, because it's not his God. He will canonize, which is to turn a man into a saint. 
a thing that will be prayed to. Yahweh is really clear on that as well. And we read that passage yesterday as well. And he says, anyone who would pray to um, a dead soul is doing something that he considers to be an abomination. He detests the individual who does these things. Particularly if they encourage their children to do them. So he is going to do the very thing. Rather than, than doing the thing that Yahweh asked, which is to attend the invitation of Yom Kippur, the Day of Reconciliation, and to answer his invitation and come into the presence of, our, of the spiritual, the feminine manifestation of Yahweh's life, the set apart spirit, and to avoid at all costs on this day any pretense of religion. Rather than doing as God asked, he's going to do as precisely as God instructed us not to do. He's going to canonize, turn an individual, a dead man, into a saint that can be preached to. There are, there's nothing that this man could do that would be more in opposition with the very God he claims to represent. Now, beyond that, you may be interested in knowing the name of the individual that he is going to call a saint. His name is uh, Unipero Sierra. Californians know him. He founded missions in California in the 18th century. He is a, uh, a Spanish Franciscan. Now, I'm Native American. I would call myself I'm part of the indigenous people of this continent. The Spanish Catholics were abysmal in their quest for money, the god of gold, and that they were also reprehensible in their compelled conversions to Roman Catholicism. And when you realize that in the first hundred years from the time these first Spanish Catholics arrived in what is now considered North and Central America. 95% of the native peoples died. Obama and Vice President Joe Biden greeted the Pope in an honor given to few foreign dignitaries. Imagine that. The United States President won't even carve five minutes out of his schedule to have a meeting with the only nation on earth that God cares about, Israel. He won't even meet with, he'll snub Netanyahu. And yet for the, the beast that is Roman Catholicism, the whore of Babylon, rolls out the red carpet. He, his family, the vice president, the vice president's family, and a host of, of religiously decorated uh, bishops and archbishops and cardinals and the like, all there. And when you do that, what you do is you give an air of authenticity, of credibility. You elevate the status of an individual that may be today, the single most despised man alive by the creator of the universe. I know that there's many of you that think that God would hate Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of the Islamic State, more than anyone else because of his enslavement and rape of little girls. And I'm sure that there's others of you that might say that that it is the head of Boko Haram and the kidnap of thousands of little girls and their systematic rape. There will be others of you who will buy the political rhetoric and say that Assad is the person that God might hate the most or the recently departed Saddam Hussein. But not even close. God's view is... Um, it's pretty consistent. That's just absolutely consistent. It's clear. 
the people he calls out and condemns, those he says he hates, he does so for a singular reason, because of the role that they play in leading people away from him. It is those like Paul, who is the person that God um, exposes more than anyone else, the founder of the Christian religion, the author of half of his New Testament. Shaul, as he was, uh, as his Hebrew name is, is the single most exposed and condemned individual in the totality of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, uh, and the single most condemned individual by Yosha. And so no one compares to Paul in terms of being despised by God. But when he is speaking generally, both Yosha and Yahweh, he will always focus on religious and political leaders with religious leaders, particularly this embodiment of religion and politics as it has existed for most of human history and as it is born together in the birth and life and even current status of Roman Catholicism, that it is those individuals whose influence leads others away from him that he considers the most reprehensible. And here is this nation embracing a man that would be at the absolute bullseye of God's condemnation. What's wrong with us? And the one country that God says, I will bless those who bless thee, and I will curse those who trifle with thee. Israel. This president doesn't have the time of day for. And yet this is the beast of Rome. Now, I'm going to share with you, because I, I think it's important, uh, two other aspects of, uh, that were interesting to me from this uh, visit. And then we're going to go on to Yom Kippur, which begins uh, tonight. First is that this pope earlier this year termed capitalism the dung of the devil. Capitalism the dung of the devil. Now, Yom was Torah. Right from the beginning, as he is describing Adam's life outside of the garden, has been individual responsibility, individual hard work, that you are going to feed yourself based upon the sweat of your brow, that you're going to toil for your own benefit. Capitalism, folks. He called it the dung of the devil. I'm going to tell you what the dung of the devil is. It's religion. The worst of all religions in all of human history is Roman Catholicism. It's not my opinion. It's what God himself told us. There was a, uh, an individual standing outside of, uh, Saint and of, um, of um, the Air Force Base, San Andrews Air Force Base, um, Andrews Air Force Base in the West. The, thinking um, San, and San is short for uh, Saint, like Santa Barbara, uh, is, uh, is uh, for the saints. Uh, but uh, uh, it is um, Andrews Air Force Base, that's where they landed, and there's a guy outside of Andrews Air Force Base that's carrying a placard, and it, um, he was dressed like in rainbow colors with rainbow colored glasses and that sort of thing, he's holding this thing. Would did Jesus discriminate? And he had a church, he said, Pope, I just want you to answer the question. And, of course, uh, this Pope would be incapable of answering it, and the person uh, holding the placard um, would be incapable of processing the answer anyway. I don't think there was any more discriminatory person on earth. Now, there was no Jesus, so the individual with the placard is completely clueless. But uh, Christianity has created a mythical character named Jesus. Uh, Yosha, the actual man, was Torah observant. That is a Torah observant person who was not conciliatory at all. He was the antithesis of tolerant. He was, of course, discriminating. If you're not discriminating, you can't be moral. 
If you're not discriminating, you can't love. If you're not discriminating, you can't be rational or just. The ability to be discriminating is the, that which differentiates us from animals. We have a conscience, which is the seat of good judgment. A soul simply enables a person to be conscious, a conscious, I should say, which is to be aware of and respond to your surroundings, to discriminate between that which is good and bad, beneficial and detrimental. One has to discriminate. And Yosha was extraordinarily discriminated. And think about those things that you just you, you just listed off, uh, mm -hmm. you know, being just, uh, being uh, love. Mm -hmm. uh, what are those things if you can't choose right. who, who, what the, where those right. things go? Exactly. What, what, those things mean nothing. Right. Uh, it's like, uh, the, the, what's a sunny day if you don't know what a cloudy day is? Right. You know? Well, here's, here's you know, telling us, do not emulate the ways of the Gentile nations. Don't be religious like they are. And he's saying that those things are an abomination to him, and those who practice those things are hated by him. Now, don't you think that is being discriminating? Isn't he telling you to be discriminating when he says, don't do that? Because if you do that, I'm going to hate you? Yeah. Wow. I mean, how could you not be, I mean, is there any way to be more discriminating, more judgmental than that? So this idea that God is that doesn't discriminate, that God is tolerant, that God is all loving, is is that's a false God. It's a God that has no uh, nothing in common and, with and, the actual God. And what is for, for that God? What is love even then? If if He just loves everyone, what is love then? Of course, love means nothing. Nothing. And did Yahweh say when it comes to Yom Kippur that any day will do? I don't care. I don't really even care if you answer my invitation. I don't care if you even pay attention to what I have to say. It doesn't make any difference. I'm not going to discriminate between those who listen to me and who respond to me and those who ignore me and lead people away from me. I will not discriminate between good and evil. I will not discriminate between that which is good, helpful, and that which is a hindrance. Can you imagine spending eternity with a God that doesn't discriminate? And is as likely to uh, to give you poison as it is something that's nourishing? It sounds like the most infuriating thing that I could possibly deal with. It, well, it, it, that would be the most. I would be so angry. It, for 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 me, dealing with that would be like if you ask somebody if they're hungry and they say yes, and you say, well, what do you want to eat? Well, I don't care. And then you list off a bunch of things, and they're just like, no, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that. It would be so infuriating I, to spend an eternity with somebody that just loved everything and it didn't really, you know, yeah, whatever, it, it, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. You know, just think, for example, this uh, this pope is going to have a mass, a mass of the Babylonian uh, religious celebration, uh, wearing uh, under the titles, uh, surrounded by people who have Roman titles, uh, which is the ultimate beast. Uh, that's the, Babylon was the first beast, Rome is the fourth. Uh, and he is going to uh, uh, do so at a, a shrine. God says, don't be religious. Don't go to a place that has uh, religious imagery uh, called Immaculate Conception. So I would ask you, how much does, God, does uh, Yahweh have to say about an Immaculate Conception in his Torah, Prophets, and Psalms? Even how much does he uh, have to say about it in terms of his own words? Did you, do you ever, ever once... Here, Yosha say, boy, what you ought to be celebrating is my immaculate conception. Never. No, and people probably heard me laugh when you said it the first time. I, it's funny to me. I, I just, I, it's hilarious. Yeah. So here, uh, Yawa does something. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to attend Yom Kippur. And this is... All I'm asking for you on Yom Kippur, there's one thing I want you to do, there's something I don't want you to do on Yom Kippur. It's an invitation, please answer the invitation, and please don't uh, try to uh, do what I'm doing for you on, the, on this day. And uh, instead, they make up something to celebrate. Why? Because 
pagan gods were immaculately uh, conceived. It's, it's how you had this blend between humans and their gods. It's how the gods of the Gentile nations all have human characteristics because the institutions and the humans that were the head of those institutions projected their own traits onto their deities. That's why Roman Catholics see the Pope as their holy father. They're projecting themselves and projecting him onto their image of God, as opposed to the other way around. Then Yahweh declared the word to Moshe, Moses, saying Moshe is an important word. It means to draw out, it means to leave, to, to be to be uh, to make the decision to walk with God away from religion and politics and patriotism and militarism and all of the things that would go along with mighty empires and nations. Then Yahweh declared the word. Yahweh uses words. Everything he has to communicate with us is communicated via words. And Yahweh declared the word to Moshe, saying, on the tenth of the seventh month. Now, do you think that he gave us this timing because he was undiscriminatory, that he didn't give a hoot what day did we celebrate this day? Or was the seventh month important and the tenth day of the seventh month important? What does ten mean in Hebrew? It means to enrich. It means to empower. It means to have a, a, a tenfold increase. And so, the reason it's the tenth is because the set of our spirit, whom we're asked to come into and invited to come into the presence of on this day, enriches us, empowers us. And it's the seventh because everything that Yahweh has designed and has promised revolves around the Shabbat and the, this realization that seven is, the, is both the Hebrew word for promise and for the number which is the sum of man in addition to God. God doesn't want to be alone. And man cannot survive alone. Together, we are God's ideal of perfection. And he called this day, the tenth day of the seventh month, a day of reconciliations. So, Kirk, if it's a day of reconciliations that we're going to celebrate this evening, would you reconcile? Let's say that you did something that, uh, that Terry, your wife, was displeased with. Would you reconcile your relationship by beating her up? Hardly. Would you reconcile your relationship by having her beat you up? I would prefer not. <laughs> okay. How about this? Would you reconcile your relationship with her by depriving yourself of, uh, of something? Well, like her. Sure. <laughs> well, yeah, that was like, yeah, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Sure, that makes it, sense. So, um, and uh, if uh, if your wife said, okay, we're estranged right now, and I'm going to establish a day of reconciliations for our relationship, and I'm going to invite you to attend this day of reconciliation, what chance would you have of reconciling your relationship with her if you ignored her invitation? Well, I hope I'd have none. Yeah, now, that wouldn't that, fair. so now here's God, and uh, the vast preponderance of mankind is separated, is separated from him because of our religious and political uh, behavior, because we're not discriminating. And so the vast preponderance of humankind is separated from him, and he has announced a day to reconcile our relationship. What do you think the likelihood is that God's going to reconcile his relationship with those who don't even bother to answer his invitation to reconcile the relationship? Well, I can just tell you there's a zero chance. Yes. And by the way, did you have to, uh, to guess that because it makes sense? Or did God say that if you don't answer this invitation to reconcile your relationship, well, uh, that you're going to die estranged? Exactly what he said. From the he family. Take, yeah. Do you think he was kidding? No. Why would he say that if it weren't true? No. Well, so since, like a, yeah. since there isn't a single Christian, a single Muslim, or a single secular humanist that is going to celebrate this day, that's going to answer this invitation, if God is telling us the truth, there isn't a single secular humanist, a single Roman Catholic or Christian, or a single Muslim that has a relationship with God 
and that will be saved by God, that will spend any time in heaven. Not one? No, or else God's a liar. Otherwise, God's a liar. Yeah. You know, if, if um, you're out in a, um, in a dinghy, having uh, survived by climbing in this dinghy in the middle of a storm that sunk the ship that you were on, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I come up in a, uh, in a ship in, in the midst of that storm, and I offer you a lifeline. I give you a lifeline, and I said, here, I will pull you up onto my ship, and we will steam out of here. And uh, you say, no, no, I, um, I don't want to do that because I don't like your plan. I want to tell you. Okay, uh, what, what if you were to say, I don't even want to listen to you. I don't see you. I don't pay any attention to you. you you're irrelevant in my religion. So just go away. Mm-hmm. Any chance that I'm going to save you? No, I'd say carry on the way you are then. Okay. And that's exactly God's position. Dark, tough question. Then Yahweh declared the word to Moshe, saying that the seventh, that the tenth day of the seventh month huh? is the day of reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Um, who's the speaker? Yahweh. And who is Yahweh? Yahweh is the Almighty, creator of the universe, and everything around, hmm. and us. So, if uh, if he says that this day is the day of reconciliations, and this is the day of reconciliations, uh, I, and, and with him anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can have a day of reconciliation with your wife if you sure. see fit. Uh, but in terms of him, if you want to reconcile your relationship with him, this is the day. Mm-hmm. Is there, and did he say, but any other day will do? No, he's very emphatic. Did he say, this is my preferred day, but, you know, I'm open to other options? Uh, no, he's very specific. All right. Um, he um, said this exists as a set-apart and cleansing invitation to be called out and meet for you to approach. Seven times, correct. Yeah, this is from called out, uh, Kara called out Leviticus 23, uh, 27. Now, um, is this the uh, the first step in the uh, in the path that he provided for reconciliation? No, actually, this is the next to the very last. This is step number six. Hmm. So then, this path this is not the uh, the first. This is actually number six of uh, of seven. It, it would make you not no longer wonder why they call themselves the. Uh, Followers of the uh, followers of the way, the path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of uh, interesting. Now, that being the case, when Yosha said the way is uh, is broad and uh, and well trodden, oh, yes. that oh, is uh, hard, that hard, leads hard. to death and destruction. destruction. Mm-hmm. Um, there will be a, a million people, according to CNN, at the at the uh, Pope's um, mass. There are 1.5 uh, billion Roman Catholics. Mm-hmm. Would uh, would that be considered many? Well, when he's already said he will say thousands, because only a th- yeah. only thousands will respond. I would say that's the uh, hard, hard to reconcile that in your yeah. mind. Yeah, didn't he say that the, that the, in his um, summer amount? Didn't he say that the way is narrow and few find it? To find it, few. So is uh, is few a million? Is few uh, a um, uh, a 1.5 billion? I, I know you said I agree. Uh, one in a million is a good equation when you think thousands to billions. Yeah, exactly. So uh, um, that means that just based on its popularity alone, forget about for a moment that, that God specifically called Roman Catholicism the most deadly and vicious beast in all of human history mm-hmm. that would tread upon the whole world. And that forget about the fact that he identified this beast with the whore of Babylon, mm-hmm. and that uh, and that this beast is the living embodiment of uh, of all that Satan desires. How just based on the fact that they're ignoring God's path and forming one of their own that is immensely popular and and in complete conflict 
with God's own testimony. How can they be right? Well, you, you can, uh, in the Day of Reconciliation, you can meet with Yahweh, mm-hmm. the Father of Thousands. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's fair to say. Or you can meet with the Roman Universal yeah. Catholic, the Roman yeah. Universal, all-encompassing, all-powerful, all-people's Pope. Yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, with the, uh, your Heavenly Father or the uh, the Holy Father. Heavenly Father or the, uh, of yeah. the Holy Father. <laughs> speak in terms of Son yeah. God. So he's going to hold a mass. Mm-hmm. Yahweh is, is instead offering an invitation. Yes. An invitation to call out, be called out, I mean, a mikra. Is there a word that is, uh, is um, a Greek word? Because Yosha uh, spoke Hebrew, so he would have used the term uh, mikra. But is there a, uh, a Greek translation of mikra that is found um, attributed to Yosha that might be um, informative? Uh, it's a zeal. Yeah. Ecclesia. Mm-hmm. And Ecclesia um, means uh, uh, to call out, doesn't it? That's what that's what Mikra is. I can you know, prior, even if you wish. Right. I'm calling you out of the world of, of human, religious, and political agendas and institutions into my family. I'm calling you away from the Holy Fathers and the Roman Catholicisms to, uh, to meet with me. And uh, here he uh, is... Uh, is saying that, like he says to uh, Shimon uh, Kepesh, that upon this rock I will build my uh, Mikra. And they changed Mikra, they translated it to Ecclesia. Uh, no harm there. Words are very similar. It's an invitation to be called out, a summons. But then they decided to change that to church and name it after a pagan goddess. <laughs> <laughs> 